If you take your Bibles and get them ready, we're going to look at some different scriptures here. But uh, we are studying the feasts of the Lord. There are seven of them. They are listed in chronological sequence in Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23 4 says, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Now, the word feast there literally means appointed times. And the word holy convocation means rehearsal. So, in other words, the feasts of the Lord were appointed times of worship for Israel that would serve as dress rehearsals in God's prophetic calendar. God is giving us a picture here, visibly of redemptive history and things that happen in Israel in the natural parallel or point to give us a picture of spiritual realities within the church. Now, fundamentally, these seven feasts represent and typify the sequence, timing and significance of the major events of the Lord's redemptive career. They commence at Calvary, where Jesus voluntarily gave himself for the sins of the world, which was Passover when it happened. And they climax at the consummation of the Messianic kingdom at the Lord's second coming, which is the festival of booths or tabernacle. These seven feasts depict the entire redemptive career of Messiah. Now, the study of these feasts is a, really a study in typology. Typology is the interpretation of Old Testament events, persons, and ceremonies as signs which prefigure Christ's fulfillment in the new covenant with the church. And typology involves identification both of a type, a figure, a concept, a ceremony, or event as an Old Testament precursor and an anti-type, a New Testament historical figure or event that follows and fulfills the promise of the type. So in the Old Covenant, you have the type. In the New Testament, you have the anti-type, which is the fulfillment. For example, take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to look at a couple passages of Scripture that, that give us a, an indication of this idea of typology. Hebrews 10.1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. The law, listen people, the law is a shadow. The coming of Christ and all that involved with Christ cast a shadow back into the Old Testament. And the purpose of the law of Moses is to give us a foreshadowing or a prefigurement of the person and work of Christ. The old sacrifices were a shadow, never a substance. Now, what you have to understand is shadows are never enough. They point that there's a shadow there because there's a reality casting the shadow. For example, you can't live in the shadow of a house. You need a house. But the shadow there is cast because the house casts the shadow. And we see these shadows in the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, we see the reality. Now, this is what always has confused me about dispensational theology. In dispensational theology, you've got the shadow, then you have the fulfillment of the shadow, then guess what happens? We go back to shadows. Because they're going to go back in the millennium to sacrifice and sacrifices again. And I'm like, I never could buy that. As a dispensationalist, I couldn't buy that. Galatians speaks against that. Hebrews speaks against it. You know, it's shadow, it's type, anti-type. You don't go backwards. We're not, after we have Christ, and we're not going to go back to having shadows again. And notice what he says in Hebrews. He says, the law is a shadow of the good things to come. Now, the word come there is the Greek word mellow. You all know what mellow means by now, right? It's about to be. It's at the point of. The good things refers to the full consummation of the new covenant. He said it was about to come. See, they weren't. They were about to come in AD 70. But the point of this writing, they hadn't come yet. They were just a few years away. A shadow of the good things which are about to come. And he says, not the very image of the things. The word image is the Greek word icon, and it means an exact replica. The law was a shadow. It was not an exact replica. Now, according to Emery Elliott's New England Puritan literature, typological hermeneutics involve explicating signs in the Old Testament as foreshadowing events and people in the New. 
This produced interesting consequences. For example, Jonah's three days in the whale typologically parallels Christ's three days in the tomb. Thomas Hartwell Horn explains in an introduction to the critical study and knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, the text that was standard reading for Brit British divinity students, he says, a type in its primary and literal meaning simply denotes a rough draft or less accurate model from which a more perfect image is made. But in the sacred or theological sense of them, a type may be defined to be a symbol of something future and distant, or an example prepared and evidently designed by God to prefigure that future thing. What is thus prefigured is called the antitype. Now, Paul, I think, declared this fundamental principle when he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. But here's the problem. Most people get stuck in the physical, and they want physical, physical, physical. The physical signs in the Old Covenant portrayed spiritual realities in the New. God revealed the mysteries of the eternal plan of redemption through the usage of temporal shadows. Turn with me to Galatians. Let me show you. I think this is clearly demonstrated in Galatians. We're told in Galatians that Abraham had two sons and thereby are given a glimpse of the significance of spiritual allegory and typology. This, folks, is a, just an incredible passage here in Galatians that opens our eyes to many things in this whole idea of a typological hermeneutic. Galatians 4.22 it says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. Is this, did this happen? Did Abraham have two sons? Yeah, Abraham, literal Abraham had literally two sons, right? Who were they? Isaac and Ishmael, right? He had two sons. One born from Hagar in the ordinary, normal way. She just had a son like people have kids. Sarah had it in a miraculous way, right? She's barren. Never expected to have kids. Way past childbearing years. All of a sudden, God says, you're going to have a child. It's miraculous. One child's born of promise, one in the natural. All right, we just got two kids here. Look at verse 23. He who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. Just a natural way. Ishmael was born like any other kid was born. But he of the free woman through the promise. See, Isaac came because of a promise that God made. Now watch verse 24. Which things are symbolic? Now wait a minute. They're literal. These things happen. But they're symbolic, physical happenings in the Old Testament. God said they're symbolic. He says, for these are two covenants. We've got two kids here. These two kids, Isaac and Ishmael, are representative of two covenants. That's what the Bible says. Two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. So Hagar and Ishmael are related to the Old Covenant, a covenant of bondage. He says, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. Not now is, okay? Now is when this was written to the Galatians, which now is, which now is gone. All right? That Jerusalem that now is is not now is. It's gone. It's history. All right? But then it was now is. It was a physical, literal Jerusalem that was there. He says, it is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Two Jerusalems, two covenants, two children. This is a strong passage of Scripture, folks, when people want to talk about, you know, these two Jerusalems are tied to covenants. If we're in the new covenant, guess what else we're in? The new Jerusalem. They're tied right here in this passage. Drop down to verse 28 of that passage. He says, Now we, brethren, speaking to the Christians, as Isaac was, are children of promise. We're not tied to that physical. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Okay, Ishmael persecuted Isaac, right? He says, just like it was then, the one who was born according to the flesh, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. He says, it's so now. What do you mean? Physical Jerusalem, the physical Jews were persecuting the Christians, weren't they? Yes, they were coming after them. Paul was constantly being persecuted, trying to be killed by them. Why? It's the same way. Because during these two covenant, the two covenants were in effect there, there was the persecution. So we see a lot about typological hermeneutics in this passage. And it is through this relationship between the two sons of Abraham 
that we are shown the eternal purposes of God in regards to the two covenants, revealed from a previously shrouded mystery. So you read the story of Isaac and Ishmael, and you think that's a great story, and you learn some things, but when you get to the new covenant, you see it has much broader implications in its spiritual realm. Now, as we move into the Feast of the Lord, I want you to understand that they actually convey two 40-year Exodus periods. You've got to understand this. The first Exodus period was one very familiar to us. Israel, after the flesh, was removed from physical bondage at Passover. They were put into the wilderness on a physical journey to a physical promised land. We know that. We've read that story. We know that. 40-year period. The feast, the seven feasts stretch out over this period. The Exodus, the, the thing that we need to understand now is the more important. The anti-type is the spiritual Exodus. And this Exodus took place from Pentecost to AD 70. This is the Exodus of Israel after the Spirit, when they left the bondage of sin and death and began a 40-year spiritual journey, journey to their spiritual inheritance was the kingdom of God or the new heavens and new earth or the new Jerusalem. See, we can learn so much from this typology. Now, in our last study, we looked at the first three feasts, which were what? Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. We saw that Passover pictures the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, who was put to death on Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures the burial of Christ. And first fruits pictured his resurrection as Messiah because he rose on the day of first fruits. Now, the next feast, the fourth feast, and the last of the spring feast is called the Feast of Weeks. It's known in Hebrew as Shavuot. It is called the Feast of Weeks because God specifically told the sons of Jacob that they were to count seven weeks from first fruits, and then one day after that, the fourth feast was to be observed. Leviticus 23, 15 says, And you shall count for yourself from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths to be completed, seven weeks. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. Seven weeks, or 49 days, and he said the day after, which would be the 50th, brings a total of 50 days. The fourth feast was to occur precisely 50 days after first fruits. In other words, this fourth feast happened exactly 50 days after the feast. The Feast of First Fruits. In the New Covenant, it happened exactly 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, names are very important in the Jewish world. They usually reflect the significant character, history, and meaning to which they were attached. And three separate names were used in Scripture for the Feast of Shabbat, which is uh, the Hebrew means weeks. Each name emphasized a, a little different facet in the observance. The most common Hebrew designation was the Feast of Weeks. Shabbat was called the Feast of Weeks because seven weeks were counted from the Feast of First Fruits until the observing this feast. The primary meaning of the feast was reflected in the Hebrew term for the Day of First Fruits, it was also called. The same feast is called the Day of First Fruits, since Shabbat was the day on which the first fruit offerings of the summer wheat crop were brought to the temple. Exodus 34:22 says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. Thus Shavuot marked the beginning of the summer wheat harvest, even as Israel's early Feast of First Fruits marks the beginning of the spring barley harvest. So you got two first fruit harvests. As I told you last week, you've got to keep that in your mind. It's important. The third designation is called the Feast of Harvest. These are all the same. They're just different names for the same thing. Reflected the fact that the festival was the official beginning of the summer harvest season. In addition to the biblical designation, the Talmud and Josephus referred to this festival as Atrazet, meaning conclusion. They viewed Shabbat as the conclusion of the Passover season and the seven-week spring harvest since there was no other major Jewish holidays until autumn. Now, in the Greek language, Shavuot was known as Pentecost, meaning 50th, since it was celebrated on the 50th day from the Feast of First Fruits. Now, 50 days has a significance or 50 has the idea of something in Scripture. What is the 50th year in Scripture? The Jubilee year. What happens in the Jubilee year? All debts are canceled. Captives are set free, right? You know, AD 70 is a Jubilee year. 
<clears throat> We're going to get to that in the future, though. Just a coincidence. Okay? Thus, the Feast of Pentecost had four main names. It's called the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost, the Day of First Fruits. Leviticus 23:15 says, As you shall count for yourself from the day of the Sabbath, and that day you brought the sheaf of the wheat offering, even seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Now, the measure of barley, which was to be brought to the temple as a first fruit offering on the Feast of First Fruits, was known as an omer. And since the counting of the days was to begin with the offering of the omer, this 50-day period is known as the omer. So you'll also hear it recalled through that whole period, time frame, called the counting of the omer. So you read all these different names. Let me tell you, just remember it as Pentecost. All right? It'll be a lot simpler to understand that. Let me give you a little history of the Feast of Weeks. First of all, let me ask you this. Does anybody know what happened on that first Shavuot? Something significant that happened in the first Pentecost. What happened? What did God do on that day? Hmm? Nobody knows. Good. You're going to learn something today. Okay, that's, that's in the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the law was given. The law was given on that first Pentecost. In the third month after the Jews left Egypt, they arrived at, si at the Sinai Desert, and they camped opposite Mount Sinai. Moses was then told by God to gather the Israelites to receive the law. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 1 says, In the third month, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, what covenant? The one he's about to give you right now, all right? Keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people on the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Does that ring a bell? Kingdom of priests, holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all the words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back to the words of the people to the Lord. This is really interesting in Hebrew. The Israelites answered, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. In literal Hebrew, it reads, it reads this way. We agree to do even before we have listened. That's kind of nuts, isn't it? Yeah, we'll do it. No matter, I don't care, we'll do it. They didn't even hear what he had to say. Well, yeah, we'll go along. That's no problem. Well, Moses then gave the Jews two days to cleanse themselves, wash their clothes, prepare to receive the law on the third day. At the same time, Moses told them not to come too near to Mount Sinai. From early morning, dense clouds covered the peak of the mountain. Thunder and lightning were frequently heard and seen. The sound of the sofar, the ram's horn, came very strong. And the top of the mountain was enveloped in fire and smoke. Can you picture this? I was out yesterday during the thunderstorm. It's just, I love storms. But the power that is there. I mean, last night when I got in bed, I had just crawled in bed, and I mean... A thunder hit, and it just, the windows vibrated, the house shook, and the next minute I was sound asleep. So I don't know how long it went off for, but I got at least one good sound in there before I fell asleep. But, I mean, it's awesome. But you can you imagine this mountain? They're, they stand at the base of the mountain. The mountain, the top of the mountain's on fire. There's smoke all over. It's just quaking and making this noise. And, I mean, God is coming to meet with the people. Exodus 19, 18 says, Now Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. So Moses goes up to the mountain. As he neared the top, a mighty voice announced the Ten Commandments to him. Now, no date is actually associated with this in the Bible. Yet you ask any observant Jewish person concerning Shabbat, and he will answer that it's always celebrated 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, because Shabbat was the giving of the law. So a very notable historical event happened in that first Shabbat, and it was the giving of the Ten Commandments. The Old Covenant came to Israel on that day. Israel came to Mount Sinai on the third day of the third month. The Lord visited the people three days later 
Therefore, the law was given by Moses in the third month of the biblical religious calendar, which is the month of Sivan, on the sixth day of the month. This day is exactly 50 days from the crossing of the Red Sea. Shavuot is called the season of the giving of the Torah in Hebrew because this is liter the literal day that God revealed himself to the people of Israel as they stood at the base of Mount Sinai. So here on that first Pentecost, the children of Israel are meeting with God and God enters into a covenant relationship with Israel. Now the new covenant antitype is Pentecost. Now when you think of Pentecost, what do you think of? What comes to your mind? Word association, Pentecost. What? Fiery tongues, all right. What else? Gifts of the Spirit, what else? I hear Pentecost, I think of Acts 2, I think of tongues, I think of charismatics. You know, these are all things that come to my mind when I think of Acts 2. You know, they're all connected. But here's what we need to think, here's what we should think of when we hear the word Pentecost. Pentecost was the beginning of what? Come on, it's not a trick question. It was the beginning of the new covenant. It was the birth of the church. Pentecost. God, the promised new covenant, had arrived. And it showed up when? On Pentecost, exactly 50 days after the resurrection. In the old covenant, the type was the law was given. God entered into a covenant relationship with Israel on Sinai. The new covenant, anti-type, exactly on that very same day, on the day of Pentecost, what happened? Acts 2. Look at Acts 2. Now, these are all just coincidences, folks, that all this happened this way, okay? Just strange coincidence. They all happened exactly the same time frame. It's going to really get coincidental in the coming weeks. Acts 2. Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. What day of Pentecost? That's, that's the, what we've been talking about. That's one of the seven feasts of the Lord that Israel had. It was the day of Pentecost when this happened. It was fully come. They were all one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues of fire as one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, Jerusalem normally had a population of about 600,000. Tacitus, the Roman historian, recorded that during the time of Pentecost, it exploded into between two and three million people. Because people were going there for... Why did people, everybody go to Jerusalem for Pentecost? It was one of the required feasts that you had to go to Jerusalem for. There was three of them. It was one of the required feasts you had to go there for. So that the house, I mean, it's just full. It was so full that it said people were sleeping on the flat roofs of the houses. They were camped outside the walls of Jerusalem. And they were given hospitality by the people within the city. Now, their presence in the city on the three main festivals was in obedience to the Torah. God commanded it. Deuteronomy 16, 16, it says, Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, which is the one we're talking about now, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So Shavuot was particularly important as a Jewish feast in the Bible days. It was one of the seven divinely appointed feasts that were given to Israel. That three, these, One of these three feasts were decreed of the Lord as solemn feasts. And they had to go to appear before the Lord. Now the people gathered for the festival. And it was uh, kind of all for maximum effect that the Lord chose this time to fulfill prophecy. And this was indeed God's prophecy. We read there that there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. They may have come for the festival, but our Lord had something else far more spectacular in mind for these people. This was the day they were to become the first fruits. They were to become members of the new church, God's church, the church of Jesus Christ. And there was a new message here for a new people. It would be heard in every language by every people. They were to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance, the wonderful, life-saving, life-changing words of the new covenant. Jerusalem is packed with people. And all of a sudden, this full city on the day of Pentecost, God breaks forth with the new covenant and they're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are coming to Christ. And then they're leaving and going back to where they came from, carrying the gospel message. And the gospel literally is exploding 
in this territory. So you have the type and you have the anti-type. Fifty days after the first Passover in Egypt, the law was given to the nation Israel on Mount Sinai, written upon tables of stone. Fifty days after the final Passover was sacrificed, the law was given to the Israel of God, written upon the hearts by the Spirit of God. Hebrews 8.10 says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. On the first Pentecost, the law was given and 3,000 people died for worshiping the golden calf, signifying the covenant of the law brought death. It was a ministration of death, Hebrews, I mean, Corinthians tells us. On the first new covenant at Pentecost, how many people got life? 3,000. 3,000 die at Sinai. 3,000 come to life at Pentecost. Just a coincidence. And they were added to the church of Jesus Christ, signifying that the new covenant brings life. The old covenant brought death. And God was picturing that from the very beginning. The new covenant brings life. On the first occasion, in 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits, God came down to Moses on Sinai to bring the law. And giving the law, God established the nation Israel as His covenant people, and they were destined to become a people manifesting the righteousness of God. They would become a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And both the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and the giving of the new covenant through the Holy Spirit to the 120 in the upper room were events that occurred on the very same day of the lunar calendar, the day of Pentecost. Now, probably one of the most beautiful images of Pentecost is that of marriage. Because it portrays the marriage between God, who is the groom, and Israel, who is the bride. In the biblical wedding service that God gives us in the Scripture, marriage consisted in two stages. The first stage is the betrothal period. You enter first into the stage of marriage. You enter this first by contract. A contract is made between the two parties. It's the betrothal period. But they do not dwell together physically until that period is over. And the betrothal is so legally binding that you can't even get out of it without a divorce. The second stage in marriage is the fullness or the consummation of the marriage. And the Bible tells us in Jeremiah that at Mount Sinai, God betrothed himself to Israel. Jeremiah 2, verse 2 says, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. He talks about betrothing himself to Israel there at Sinai. Now, what does the wedding mean in terms of Christ and the new covenant? Well, Jesus is the groom. Who's the bride of Christ? Now, this is a trick question. Who's the bride of Christ? All right, be specific. All the church? We are the offspring of that bride. But let me let me try to get let me try to lay this out for you. Those first century believers were betrothed to Christ. At Pentecost, he entered into a betrothal period with the first century church. He came so that whosoever would put their trust in Him would receive forgiveness of sins. And it included both Jew and Gentile. In the ascension, Christ went to heaven to be with God the Father. But before He left, He promised His first century disciples what? That He would come back, right? John 14.3 says this, If I go to pre prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am there you may be also. Who is He talking to? talking to the 11 at that point. Judas had already gone. If you read up in the text, Judas, you know, he took off. He's talking to the 11. He says, I'm coming back for you. He was leaving them. Where was he going? We're well, speaking of his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. But he promises to come back and receive them to himself. He's referring to his second coming. And during the transition period, which I like to refer to from Pentecost to Holocaust, all right, from, eight, from Pentecost to 8070, which was Holocaust, Christ didn't dwell with His disciples. He left them. Why? Because it was the betrothal period. And during the wedding, the, the Hebrew idea of marriage, you don't dwell with them during the betrothal period. 
He was betrothed to them for that period, but he was going to come again to get his bride. And see, when you understand this concept, it makes the fact that Christ has not returned yet ridiculous. This betrothal period has been 2,000 plus years and Christ still has not come back and got his bride to dwell with her. Therefore, the first century believers in Christ were spiritually betrothed to him. They were to enter the full marriage and dwell with him when he returned for his bride. So the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai involved the Aaronic priesthood, the sacrificial system, the tabernacle, the Sabbath days, the festival, the civil ceremonial laws, the Ten Commandments. These things were given by God as a shadow of the good things to come, to teach us about Jesus and the redemptive work of God. Shavuot was the birth of the congregation in the wilderness. The things given at Mount Sinai were divine and they were from God, but they show in a physical way to enable us to understand spiritual truths that God wanted to communicate to us as church. So God gave Israel a covenant, the Torah, the services, the oracles of God, the promises, which were divine at Mount Sinai. He did this. Why? To teach us about Christ. Psalm 40, verse 7 said, Then said I, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written to me. The whole testament is about Jesus Christ. You know, the saddest thing was when he showed up, the people who studied the Old Testament missed it. They were so caught in the type, they couldn't move on to the anti-type. They couldn't move on. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago when we did this first lesson, I, I said to you at Pentecost, something different happened that seems a little weird in the offering. What is it about the offering that's a little weird in Pentecost? Hmm? No. No one knows? You don't remember the question I asked you? At Passover, leaven was absolutely forbidden. In the regular meal offering, no leaven was permitted. And we saw in our last study that leaven was a picture of sin. So Passover and unleavened bread spoke of the death and burial of Jesus Christ who was without sin. Yet on Pentecost, God commanded the exact opposite. Leviticus 23:17 he says, You shall bring from your dwelling two wave loaves of two tenths and ephah. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Now the temple services for Pentecost followed much the same pattern as the Feast of First Fruit since both holy days were celebrated with first fruit offerings. However, the offering for Pentecost was unique. It consisted of two long, flat, leaven loaves of wheat bread as commanded by the Lord. Now the two loaves were not burned because the Lord had forbidden leaven to come on the altar. It says, you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. Instead, these loaves and the two lambs as a peace offering formed a wave offering for Pentecost. The priests waved them before the altar, forwards and backwards and then up and down. Afterwards, they sat aside. They were set aside for the priests and they formed a festival meal eaten by the priests later that day in the temple. And thus, they were called the Feast of Pentecost. So on Pentecost, they were to wave two loaves of leavened bread. What do these loaves typify? What, any clue? Two loaves. What happened at Pentecost that was so unique when the church began? What was so unique about the church? What was different about the church in Israel? It was no longer Jew only. It was Jew and Gentile. God's bringing both these people into the church. That's what he says. God so loves the world. And people say, well, that means everybody. It doesn't mean everybody. He didn't like Esau. It can't mean everybody. And I don't think Esau's the only exception. But he loved the world, meaning it's not just Jews, it's Gentiles. Too low, Jew and Gentile. Why leaven? Why is there leaven picturing sin in the two loaves of the church? Is the church filled with sin? Listen to this. Listen to the new covenant. Promise of the new covenant. Hebrews 8.10. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel. He's quoting from Jeremiah. I'll put my laws in their mind. I'll write them on their hearts. I'll be their God, dealing with my people. None of them will teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they'll know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteous. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. No more are going to remember their sin. Why? Because God, in the new covenant, is going to put away sin. Put away sin. One of the features of the new covenant is I will remember their sins no more. If you go back to Daniel, 
Daniel 9 and verse 24, he says, Seven weeks or 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Daniel was told that 70 weeks had been determined on the people of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and by the end of this prophetic time period, God promised that six things would be accomplished, and one of the things was that Daniel was told that there would be an end of sin. Ezekiel prophesied at the time that the end would be made in Israel's sins. In Ezekiel 36, 24, he says, I'll take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries. I'll bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. This prophecy is synchronous with the 70th week of Daniel. This is the promised new covenant. So why is the church pictured as having leaven in it when the very promise of the new covenant was to remove their sins? You don't know? Good. Maybe you'll have a chance to learn something else this morning too then. I believe it is because the new covenant was not totally consummated at Pentecost. It was introduced. It was a betrothal period. Pentecost. The church is born. But the Old Covenant still existed. Did it not? The Old Covenant was still existing until A.D. 70. Hebrews was written approximately 62 to 64 around there. And in Hebrews 8.13, he talks about the Old Covenant as decaying and waxing old, ready to vanish away. So between Pentecost... In Holocaust, or the Day of Atonement, sin has not yet been put away because Jesus Christ had not yet returned. He had gone into the Holy of Holies as in His ascension, as the typify the priest of the Old Covenant. But Israel never had any confidence of any forgiveness of sins until that priest came out of that temple. And Jesus had not come out of the temple yet in His second coming. And I think it's safe to say that most believers think redemption was completed at the cross. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Redemption is tied to the second coming. Luke 21, 27 says, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when they see these things begin to happen, and Luke ties this with the destruction of Jerusalem, look up, lift up your hands, because your redemption is drawing near. When Christ returned, He brought Redemption. As long as the old covenant existed, the believers were not perfected. The believers did not have access to God because their sin had not yet been dealt with. Hebrews 9, 8 says, The Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. As long as that old covenant was exist in existence, the way into the holiest had not yet been made complete. Man was still... Dealing with sin, he couldn't get in there. They weren't made perfect under that old covenant. And because they were not perfect, they couldn't enter in God's presence. But once the old covenant was destroyed, it is a picture that God is saying, that's over, that's done, man is perfected, he has sins have been forgiven, he can come into the new covenant. See, what the saints had in the transition period was the down payment of what we now possess. They were betrothed, were married. Ephesians 1.13 says, In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You know what that Holy Spirit was? He was the wedding ring. He was the wedding ring saying, I'm coming back for this bride. He was a guarantee. The word in the Greek is autobahn. And it means a pledge, a part of the purchase money. Now I'm coming back for this bride. 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 2 Corinthians 5.5 5, Now He who has prepared for us this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. See, the transition saints had in pledge what we have now. They had a guarantee of what was to come. Well, we have it. Christ betrothed them and then He had to come back and get His bride. And that's the picture of Revelation. He comes out of heaven and Jerusalem comes out as a bride prepared for her husband and He receives His bride. And a completion was made. They entered in the fullness of redemption. Their sins were forgiven. Pentecost speaks of the birth of 
of Israel as a nation, as well as the birth of the church of Jesus Christ. And I think the two loaves represent Jew and Gentile in one church of Jesus Christ. Even though both Israel and the church are chosen by God and are holy to Him, sin was still found in Israel and sin still existed in the church in the transition period. It had not been put away. Passover and unleavened bread speak primarily of Jesus who is without sin, but Pentecost speaks of Israel and the New Testament church where sin still did exist. To natural Israel, Passover was their freedom from bondage of Egypt. Unleavened bread was the separation from the land of Egypt into the immersion into the Red Sea and in the cloud in the wilderness. Finally, God led the people to Mount Sinai where they experienced Pentecost and God revealed Himself to the people in a deeper and greater way than He ever had done previously and He entered into a covenant relationship with them at Sinai. Now the spring festivals were fulfilled by Jesus who was our Passover Lamb. He died on the day of Passover. He was without sin and He is the bread of life. Jesus was in the sepulcher on the day of unleavened bread and He was the kernel of wheat that was buried in the earth. And Jesus arose as the first fruits of the barley harvest. He Himself being the first of those who were arise from the dead. And finally, the promised new covenant arrived during the Feast of Pentecost to gather all believers into the church to be God's harvest, spring harvest in the earth. And as these four feasts describe in detail the significant events during the first coming of Messiah when He came to redeem man, Back to God, following the fall of man in the garden, we'll find that the fall festivals give us a tremendous insight and understanding concerning the events of Jesus Christ's second coming. Now, are these festivals separated by 2,000 years? I don't think so. I think they all happened in a second 40-year period, just like the first ones happened in a 40-year period. And we'll get into that in the weeks to come and hopefully learn some more of God's marvel. Let me tell you what this study does for me. I marvel at the unsearchable riches of the Word of God. Is this all just coincidence? I mean, God gives the law at Sinai. The very day Pentecost is being celebrated, the church is born. The gospel comes forward. These things are just coincidence. It's amazing. It's amazing. And as we learn of Israel's feast, we see God's whole redemptive calendar laid out in a beautiful picture. Amazing. This book is so incredible. Why do we waste so much time doing other things? Well, we could be spending time learning the Word of God. Learning the, the marvels and the mysteries and the greatness of our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for the wonders of Your Word. Father, it is living and it is active. We know it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray You use it to do surgery on our hearts, Lord. Bring us into a deep understanding relationship with You where we... Father, put You first and foremost in our lives above everything else. Lord, it's absolutely incredible as we study Your Word and, it, and we see these riches in it. It's beautiful. It's marvelous. It's incredible. Thank You, Lord, for giving us the privilege of having the Word of God and the, the privilege of reading and studying and learning of who You are. Oh, Father, give us a heart to know You better. Help us to understand just what a book the Word of God is. Help us to understand it is alive. It's the Word of the living God communicated to us. Father, forgive us for our neglect of it. Give us a burning desire to study it, to learn of You. We might walk in a deep and abiding fellowship with You. In Jesus' name, Amen.